tree of life. Now, Father, as I speak once again into thy people, it's again that I am asking, if you please, just hide this, your servant, behind the cross, that those who are here might see thee and not me. Let the words now of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my strength and my redeemer. In the name of Christ our Lord, we ask it all. Amen. Amen. We are so grateful to God for all of us being here this morning once again that we may lift up the name of Jesus. I'm glad that all of you uh, set your clocks to the right time and you made it here on time this morning. Amen. So we thank you and those who will come through the door in about five, ten more minutes. We're going to welcome them too if they forgot to set their clocks. So we're just going to praise God and thank him for his goodness and for his mercy. I want to thank Brother uh, French for being here this morning. Amen. Did such a beautiful job on the saxophone. I, I always think... I always think back to Psalm 150 when it tells us that we should praise him on with the trumpet, with the harp, on the lute. It says, praise him with the tremble and dance, uh, on the stringed instruments and flutes and loud sound and cymbals. I always think about that, the clashing cymbals. And then it says, let everything that has breath. Praise the Lord. If you got breath in your body, you ought to praise the Lord. Amen. 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 So thank you, Brother French, for your presence here this morning. And as I have already stated, at any time that you're here, you're always welcome to worship with us here at Lake Providence. For those of you who have your Bibles with you this morning, there is a word from the Lord from the seventh chapter of the gospel according to St. Matthew. And then I want you to find also uh, John, the 15th chapter. And I want to connect the two this morning just briefly here as we speak to you from the uh, topic of kingdom principles, the way into the king, kingdom principles. All of us are children of the king. Those who have dug deep to get on a solid foundation, who have professed Christ as being your Lord and Savior, you are kingdom kids. Amen. And I don't care how old you are, you're still a kingdom kid. Amen. And I thank you. I thank God for the fact that you are a child of the king. Uh, Sister, Sister uh, Shelton out there just had a birthday this month, 92 years young, and she's a kingdom kid. Amen. She loves the king. And I'm so thankful to the Lord that God, regardless as to how he, uh, how much time he allows us here on this side. We're ever learning, we're ever in the process of striving to do the will of our king, and we are his children. We are his sheep. We are the sheep of his pastor. And what we do each Sunday when we come here, each time we get a chance to come into the presence of the Lord in this sanctuary, we worship him and we praise his name. I was thinking about this passage during the course of this week, but I also tied into it, John, the 15th chapter, where Jesus is speaking, and Jesus said, I'm the true vine. My father is the husbandman or the caretaker of the vine. He says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. But every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, that it may bring forth more fruit. And I thought about the fact of farming and how that when you are raising something at the very beginning and outset of a tomato plant, more especially, a tomato plant will begin to bloom very early as it is planted. And those little vines at the very bottom of the plant, when the plant is planted, you're supposed to, when it begins to bloom down at the lower part that as to where it is going into the ground, you're supposed to prune those off. And the reason why you prune those off is because of the fact it will take away 
the strength of the plant to produce as it gets bigger because of the fact these little blooms that are down here, they really won't bear the type of fruit that you really want to, to eat from that plant because it sucks away the energy of the plant itself. Now, once you take those off, the plant continues to bloom and grow up and get larger. And as it gets larger, then as you begin, and I don't know how many of you know about tomato playing, but or anything about growing a tomato plant, but tomato plants, depending on the type of tomato, can grow quite tall. And so therefore you have to put a pole down by the plant and as the plant begins to grow, you tie it up so that the fruit that it bears does not weigh it over where it touches the ground. And once it touches the ground, that can begin the rot of the fruit itself. So therefore you have to tie it up so that that fruit continues to grow and grow up. And then as they ripen, hello somebody, then you pick off those juicy tomatoes that are ripe from your garden or from your patio plant that you planted as to where you can have some ripe, delicious tomatoes. This ain't the time to plant no tomatoes though. I want y'all to know that also. It's too cold still. We're going to get a few more cold spells and frost. Unless you're taking it in and out of doors right now when it's warm and then taking it back outside. But that's still not advisable at this time. Tomatoes are an interesting fruit because of the way that they grow and the way that you have to care for them as a farmer or as a gardener as to when you plant them. There are those of us who like once the fruit is on the vine and it is still green. There are a few of us who like to pick those large green tomatoes and we take them in and we slice them up and we put them in meal and cornbread and we put them in the skillet and we f have fried green tomatoes. I, I got to quit talking about food this early in the morning. <laughs> um, and, and the members get on me about this, all of y'all who have visited because they said here some of them have mad breakfast yet. And they get hungry when I get to talking about fried green tomatoes and other food. But this is the way in which a plant grows. Jesus is saying to those who are followers of him, every branch that stays in me, connected to the vine. He is the vine. He's the lifeline of salvation. He is the one in which we can bear more fruit if we just stay connected to the vine. He says, but there are those who are there, and they're like those little blooms that began get all excited but haven't been saved, get all uh, hyped up over what they've heard but won't abide in the Word. See, in order to abide in the word of God, we must be obedient to the will of God. We must be the ones who are striving to live out a life that is pleasing, not to each other, but to God Almighty. That's who we are striving to please, not to impress somebody else, not to impress me, not to impress your father, your mother, the deacons or the mothers of this church or any other church leader. But we are to strive to please almighty God, not to even impress him because he knows when we are faking. Y'all getting it? Okay, I want you to understand kingdom principles, the, the way into the kingdom. Turn back with me to the book of Matthew now, if you please, just for a moment. At the 13th verse of chapter 7, you find as to where he says, enter at the narrow gate. He says, in enter, 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 strive to get in the narrow gate. He says, because broad is the way that leads to destruction. He says, and there are many who are going in at that gate. In other words, that broad spectrum 
of to the way that people want to perceive that the Christian life is, that broad spectrum of trying to do it and do it in and every kind of way, the broad spectrum as to where doctrinally people take the Word of God out of its context to make it say something that it does not say. And there are those who are doing that all over the world in this day and time, and especially here in the United States of America, in the church that we see that is going on now. There are doctrines that are being preached and taught that do not make sense. And we've got to be sure that we are studying it, we are hearing it, and we are applying it according to the word of God. There's so many times that I've seen as to where there have been those who've spoken the word of God and as they began to try and preach a sermon, they only take a verse and that verse is taken completely out of its context and where we read above and below is a perfect explanation as to what the word of God is actually saying at that time in the word. So many times there are those who want to pick and choose according to the word of God as to where we treat it as though we have gone to a restaurant where it is a smorgasbord of food and we can pick and choose what we like on the smorgasbord. And there are many who want to preach the gospel in the same context of going to that restaurant. The Bible says that this, the, the, that this word of God that was given from old into new was given by divine inspiration of almighty God. And by the divine inspiration that was given, it tells us that holy men spoke as the Holy Spirit spoke to them. And they embedded this thing into their conscience and into their minds and into their daily lives. And they taught it and they preached it from the perspective of it being God's word, final authority as to what we should believe. Here's what he says in this. Strive to enter at the narrow gate. Why? Because broad is the gate. And there is a, there's a wide path that leads to destruction. He said, but, but the narrow gate, he says, it's a difficult way, but it leads to life. And there are few that be that find it. And then right behind this, this is the end of Jesus' sermon on the mount. If you go back and you begin to read at the very beginning of the Beatitudes, this is the very end of the message when you get over to chapter 7. Look at the very next portion in here as what it states. He says, beware of false prophets. He has already warned us. This is the essence as to what will take place. This is what we see that is taking place in our day and time. Beware of false prophets. Beware, they come to you in sheep clothing, he says, but inside who they are, they are ravenous wolves. He said, you will know them by their fruit. And that's the reason why I wanted to start out with the illustration of the tomato plant. Look at what the tomato plant does when it is pruned, when it is cultivated, when the soil is kept loose around it. Look at the tomato plant as to where the nourishment that it receives and from that nourishment it produces beautiful, good fruit. But he says, look at these. He said, you will know them by their fruit. He said, do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs, uh, 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 figs from the thistles? He said, even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. In other words, 
what it is saying is when it is properly cultivated, when it is properly taken care of, it will bear beautiful, good fruit when you when you are searching the word of God to find out the truth of God's word when you're digging deep into your study and your time of prayer your time of meditation in the word of God what it produces inside of each one of us is good fruit it produces a life that walks by faith and not by sight. It produces a life that trusts totally in God. It produces a prayer life, something that is consistent as to where we pray and pray with understanding and waiting on the answer from Almighty God. Not going out there on our own, not doing it in and of ourselves, not striving to please the world but to live to please almighty God. Look at what it says. A good tree cannot bear uh, bad fruit, and neither does a bad tree produce good fruit whatsoever. But every tree that does not bear good fruit, he said, is going to be cut down and thrown into, vi into the fire. He says, therefore, you shall know them by their fruit. The very next session, here's what he has to say to each one of us. He says, not everyone, because all of these are you going to see. He wants to prepare each one of us for the walk of life where we're going to be in this world. He wants to prepare us for the things that we will be faced with. He wants to prepare us for the obstacles that are out there because I'm here to tell you, they're out there. I don't want any of us to be deceived and especially these young ones who have just been baptized into the church to think every day is going to be sunshine, everything's going to be all right, everything's going to be easy. No, it's not. There are going to be obstacles that we must face, but we are on the winning team. I'm here to tell you, I'm on the winning team. I know that Christ is real. I know that the only means of salvation is through and by him. I know that his blood cleanses from all sin. And there's no other way that I can be saved other than the blood of Jesus. Thank God there's not another way. See, because if there were other ways, Christ died in vain. If there were other ways, Christ's blood cannot cleanse me. If there's another way as to where I could do it in and of my own through works or anything of that magnitude, I would be trying to work out my own soul salvation through the works so that I might be saved. But not my works, hello somebody, they're no good. I am, I, I want to explain this thing. As virtuous of a woman as Mary was, as holy of a man that, that Peter, James, and John were once they got saved, as holy of a man as Paul was, as holy as Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Daniel and all of these guys throughout the Old Testament were once they got saved. You pile all of their works up right here. You begin to pile it all up. And nothing, none of their works would get them into the kingdom of Almighty God. This thing is by grace through faith, which is the gift of God, lest I brag on anything else other than the blood of Jesus. That's what it's about. Not my goodness, but by his blood. Not by what I can do, but it's about what he has already done. And I believe for the, for, for on the work's sake of what Christ did on the cross, that my salvation is secure 
in the blood of Jesus. That's where it is. Now, I'm not standing before any of you or visitors or anything else to tell you either that I'm a perfect man. No, I'm not. I have sinned, I have fallen short of the glory of God just like anybody else, but thanks be to God for the blood of Jesus. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying by his blood that God sees me through the blood of Christ and I become the righteousness of God in Christ through the blood of Jesus. That's the only thing that makes any of us righteous. That's the only thing. Let's look at the final part of it. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father. What is he saying? Here's what he's saying. Look at the very next verse. He says, there are going to be a whole bunch of them. In that day, he said, that's going to say, Lord, hey, Lord, remember, we prophesied in your name. We preached some awesome sermons. I preached until the hair stood on my head, and I was bald. That's what they're going to say. He said, And there are going to be others who are going to say, we cast out some demons by your name. The demons came out because they used the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And demons are subject to the name of Christ. Yes, they did it. That's what the Bible says. He says, we've done many wonderful things in your name. Built a hospital and it was in your name. We named it Jesus Healing Hospital. And it was put there in your honor and your name. But was it? Did you do it in my name, really? Did you do it for your self-recognition? Is that what you did it for? You took the glory when the glory should have went on high. And he says, we did many wonderful things in your name. He said, but I'm going to declare to them, I don't know you. Why? Because you're workers of iniquity. Let me tell you what we ought to be doing. Where we see great things happen, where we see souls saved, where we see those who come into the body of Christ, that we might even, and I pray that none of us are that way, we feel that they're unworthy. Don't feel that way. You were unworthy. I was unworthy. And regardless as to where a man or a woman may be in their life, God's word says, I will pick you up out of the muck and the mire. I will place your feet upon the solid rock, which is Jesus. And I will give you that opportunity to witness in my name. I will give you that opportunity to to live a life that is pleasing to Christ. I will give you that opportunity to build on the solid rock, but the glory never gets put on or, but it's to him. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. This morning, do you know it? Do you know that he'll do great things in your life? I don't care where you've been, what you've done. He can do great things in your life if you surrender to his will. As the choir shall sing a verse of a song, the doors of the church, again, are open to you by letter, by Christian experience, by candidate for baptism. Come knowing 
that he'll make a change in your life. There are deacons in the balcony as well as those who are at the back, and there will be those here at the front who will bring